great honor to be here. I'm very pleased to have been invited here by the Morin Hur Tower Company. I'm Daniel Zafarik. I am the editor of publications for the Council on Tall Buildings and Urban Habitat. I want to tell you a little bit about the organization that I represent. The Council was founded in 1969 by Lynn Beadle, who was an engineer and academic at a university in Pennsylvania. Uh, it was a time in which Many skyscrapers were being developed using new technologies, and there was an understanding in the industry that uh, these technologies were coming to bear and advancing the overall cause uh, of the industry. However, uh, it was important for people to keep up with the newest developments, so this organization was formed. Now we're uh, 40 plus years on, uh, 700,000 plus members uh, across 4,000 offices and approximately 450 uh, organizational members. Uh, as you can see, some of our top level members are among the most prominent construction, engineering, uh, contracting, and project management firms in the planet. Our organization produces a great deal of publications uh, that are an outgrowth of our research. Uh, they range in size from the very large uh, uh, Tall Buildings Reference book, which is something like 512 pages. Everything you wanted to know about buildings and more. Uh, and then we go right down to smaller, more digestible uh, documents such as the wind tunnel testing of high build, uh, sorry, the wind tunnel testing of high-rise building, natural ventilation in high-rise buildings, and uh, outrigger design in high-rise buildings. These are smaller technical guides that are produced by our working groups. I edit the CTBUH Quarterly Journal, which uh, contains one prominent uh, building case study and several research papers by academics and practitioners uh, who explain uh, the various issues uh, that affect the design, construction, and operation of tall buildings. We have an annual awards program. Uh, every year we give out uh, the best tall buildings to the various regions in the country. Uh, this includes Asia, North America, uh, Middle East, and uh, Africa. Research. Uh, we're primarily a research organization, so we compile a great deal of information on tall buildings, including uh, height statistics, uh, their various rankings in terms of their uh, uh, markets, so from cities to regions to nations. We compile all that information and rank the buildings accordingly. Uh, as you can probably imagine, with the pace of construction that's happening now uh, across the world, uh, particularly in Asia, uh, it's, it's a full-time job to keep track of this information. Uh, and then we produce helpful infographics and other reports off of that data. The best place for you to access that data is the Skyscraper Center. This is our online resource that uh, allows you to create lists and sort and slice and dice information so that you can determine uh, the kind of tall building information that you want about your market. Uh, we're making several enhancements to the Skyscraper Center, including uh, an improved member page so that you can have uh, your materials uh, on full display with related stories uh, from our global news department. Uh, yes, these are the working groups that I measured, uh, mentioned before. These are uh, groups of academics and uh, practitioners who get together to uh, advance the state of technology in tall building design. And they have produced these books which we, which we offer. So 
So we present a great deal of signboards and plaques. Uh, these are uh, commemorating uh, the various uh, statuses of these tall buildings. We have the Q1 tower here in Gold Coast, Australia, which was at the time the world's tallest residential tower. And then uh, if you look over on the right, we've got the Trump Tower uh, in Chicago, which got the uh, award for the uh, tallest all concrete residential building in the world. Um, and that's a very important trend actually, which I'm going to refer to a little bit later. We have international events all over the world. Uh, we have uh, building tours of under construction and completed buildings, as well as uh, conferences that draw in excess of 800 people. Uh, and uh, they are great opportunities for practitioners and academics to meet each other and network and uh, further the development of the tall building industry. We've had a great number of conferences uh, all over the world since 1971 in locations such as London, Dubai, Seoul, Chicago. And uh, this coming year, uh, we will have our next conference in Shanghai. Uh, I will invite uh, all of you who are in the construction industry related to tall buildings to submit papers. Uh, the call for papers is now out. Um, we tend to have a very high uh, level of speaker at our conferences. Uh, so here you can see uh, we have Adrian Smith, who was the designer of three of the world's tallest buildings, uh, speaking there, as well as many local officials and uh, national level officials in the host country. And that's the conference venue coming up. So I want to talk about um, some recent tall building trends. This is an outgrowth of the research that we do. Tall building trend one is an increase in height. Simply put, buildings are getting taller. Uh, even since the early 2000s, we've effectively doubled the height of what would be considered possible uh, for a skyscraper. So you see the uh, Petronas Towers there in Kuala Lumpur, very famously usurped the Chicago Sears Tower as the tallest buildings in the world, based on our criteria that they're measured to the architectural top, which is the top of the spire. Uh, unfortunately, the antennae that were on top of the uh, uh, Sears Tower have um, variable height. Uh, sometimes they can be changed. So it actually counted against the Sears Tower. And there was quite a bit of uh, controversy in the US when this happened. But that, is, uh, that tower is completely dwarfed by the Burj Khalifa, which has risen in Dubai um, at 828 meters. There is now on the books and currently under construction a 1,000 meter tower in Saudi Arabia, the Kingdom Tower. Incidentally, uh, will also be designed by Adrian Smith. There's more tall buildings as well as taller buildings. Uh, as, as early as, uh, as, late, as most recently as the 2000s, we had uh, only about 40 buildings over uh, 200 meters, whereas now we have 84, and we're expecting in 2014, 110 to complete. The location of the buildings is changing. Uh, the, the sort of archetypal uh, tall building in the 1970s would have been uh, a steel office building in North America. But that's completely changed. Now, as you can see across these charts, uh, it's quite a bit more likely that the, uh, if a tall building is being built, it's in Asia, it's made of uh, composite materials and predominantly concrete, uh, and it's a mixed-use building, so it will combine multiple functions uh, into one uh, vertical city, if you will. Those trends kind of blend together. They're almost, they're very much hand-in-hand -hand with each other. Here's another big trend that I think is going to apply uh, to our situation here. Um, change in title and motivation. It used to be that we built these towers to project the power of an individual corporation such as the Chrysler Corporation in New York or the Sears company, uh, Sears Robot Company in Chicago. That was uh, kind of the pre-2000 trend. After 2000, uh, we started to see in our globalized and connected world, cities competing with each other. In fact, entire nations competing with each other for market share, not just companies. So now you see buildings named things like Taipei 101, the Chicago Spire, which unfortunately did not get built. Uh, and uh, the Shanghai Tower, which is almost uh, completed in uh, Shanghai. Uh, 
there's been a change in title and motivation um, also across the uh, aesthetics. So if you take a look at um, this Condé Nast building in New York, uh, you know there's some, artic there's some architectural articulation to generate interest, but it's still pretty much an extruded square that's brought up from the ground. It's just an, it's just an extrapolation of an efficient floor plan. But if you look at the building on the right, the Bahrain World Center, uh, you've got a sort of fanciful building that is a parabolic shape that not only is meant to recall the uh, sailing culture of the uh, seaside city, but also to direct wind through the turbines. So these are the drivers and influencing factors behind tall buildings. Why are we, why are we even doing this? Well, the number one reason is, as always, land prices. Uh, here and everywhere else, the price of land is going up and it's simply more efficient to put a tall building on a small piece of land. The importance of creating a global icon. As I said before, cities, entire nations are competing with each other, not just corporations. And so it's important to, uh, especially uh, developing or new economies, to make an important statement about their arrival on the global stage. And one way of doing that is with a tall building. Population growth and urbanization, I'm sure my colleague from the United Nations could confirm this, but uh, we are seeing a tremendous uh, migration to cities. Something like ten, seven in 10 of all people on the planet will live in cities by 2050. 200,000 uh, people are urbanizing every day. That means they're either born into an existing city or they're moving to a city. That means that in order to accommodate them, we will need to build the equivalent of a city of one million every week for the next 20 years. Are you ready? <laughs> so driver four, changing social demographics. I've altered these slightly to reflect uh, developing nations such as Mongolia. We have better health care, and that leads to longer life expectancy. We have smaller household sizes. We have better educated people who are more interested in an urban lifestyle. I'm told that 60% uh, of uh, people in Mongolia are 30 years or younger, so I think this applies to you. Uh, rising prosperity, uh, look all around us at the construction. People are marrying later as they seek professional careers. As a result, there's a big boom in housing construction. Most of these are smaller apartments. Uh, families are moving out of lower grade housing and young people are moving out of their parents' houses sooner, which I'm sure pleases the parents. Uh, tall building driver five is energy, sustainability, and climate change. There's nothing inherently sustainable about a tall building. Uh, left alone by itself, it's actually a tremendous consumer of uh, energy uh, in its operation, as well as embodied carbon in its construction. However, when it's plugged into a community uh, that is well integrated with transit and public amenities, it has the uh, ability to energize the entire uh, area around itself such that other people uh, become interested in developing and then the land prices around the tower uh, begin to grow and there you have more towers. So these are the current tallest buildings in the world. As you can see, we have uh, Burj Khalifa there more than taking the cake at 828 meters. Uh, it probably won't surprise you to learn that both the current and the predicted tallest 20 in 2020 uh, will be megatalls and they will largely be in Asia. That one on the far left is the uh, Kingdom Tower in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. So let's talk a little bit about the connection of tall buildings to place. Um, I think that there's been a little bit of a problem with the rapid construction of tall buildings uh, in recent times. Uh, and, and I'll try to explain what, that, what I mean by that. Historically, these buildings had a connection with place. Uh, so if you look at a classic turn of the century skyscraper in Chicago, uh, you know, Chicago had a devastating fire in the 1870s. It leveled the city. It was mainly made of wood. So uh, there was a great resurgence in the steel industry around the time of the Columbian Exposition, which was a World's Fair. Uh, so they wanted, the city wanted to proclaim the arrival of this industry and the importance of steel in construction. So they uh, made these buildings with very wide bay windows. They also wanted to emphasize the commercial nature of the city, so uh, they made them like shop windows, both 
at the street level and uh, at height. The Chrysler building similarly looks pretty much like a 1929 Chrysler. So as we progressed, uh, buildings became more square. Uh, based on the uh, Seagram building, which was a very famous building in New York, done by Mies van der Rohe, uh, it was a classic design. Uh, it was very much, uh, very well liked by developers because it reflected the efficiency of the floor plan in a very sort of utilitarian guise. The thing about international style that was a, both a good thing and perhaps not such a good thing is that you could reproduce it just about anywhere and have the same building. The thing that's not so great about that uh, provoked a reaction. This is the complete opposite effect. Here you have the extreme iconic sculptural design phenomenon where these buildings could be anywhere. They don't appear to have any relationship to where they're being designed. And uh, it's not clear why they're shaped the way they are. Then you get uh, into literal cultural symbolism. Uh, the Taipei 101 was done uh, to mimic the style of the pagoda, the traditional vernacular architecture uh, in Taiwan. And in uh, Kuala Lumpur, you get a little bit more of an abstract example. Uh, here you have the uh, Islamic uh, temple patterns which are uh, reflected in the bris soleil that surround this building. You would never confuse it with a temple, however, uh, the reference is quite obvious. So that brings us to Mongolia. What will the Moritkho Tower mean to Mongolia and to the world? A tall building, when it is done well, has enormous potential to generate economic and cultural activity. The cultural and economic aspirations of Mongolia will be on display to the world in the shape of this building. In a world of generic and similar buildings that contribute very little to their environments, this is an opportunity to create a contextual icon that could only be made in Mongolia. Now is the time to consider not only it as literal symbolism, but how it embodies the values of the Mongolian people, the city of Ulaanbaatar, and the owners. Moringhar Tower has the potential to drive further investments and create new communities around itself. If it is done well, it is a symbol for the future of economic development and a demonstration point for new ideas of technology, public space, and environmental sustainability. Through CTBUH, the Council on Tall Buildings and Urban Habitat, Moringhar Tower is a top tier member uh, is obviously taking this obligation very seriously. They will have access to the latest contemporary standards in tall building design, construction and operation, the highest caliber professionals in the industry, and the latest research in subjects ranging from sustainability to wind engineering to seismic mitigation. The CTBUH supports Morin Kher Tower in its efforts to develop the best possible building for this unique place and which will stand the test of time. And here you see uh, executive management accepting the certificate of membership from executive director Anthony Wood at last year's conference in Shanghai. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Oh, don't hey. 